Hello, my name is David Coletta, and I'm the senior leader at Mission Community Church. Before you begin watching the Sermon of the Week, allow me to pray that you might encounter God right there where you are. Father, I ask that your spirit will be present right where people are watching this video. May they be receptive to the voice of your spirit as they watch in Jesus' name, amen. From all of us at MCC, may God bless you as you watch this week's message. There is a name that reigns without contention Whose power can't be questioned or contained With humble fame He rules the earth and heavens His glory knows no measure or refrain and his person past the borderlands of space And Jesus enthroned upon the praises of our hearts And Jesus, you're the King and you're the center of it all
going to have a fantastic time uh, in the Word of God today. But before that, we need to do something. I need you, if you have a watch, look at your watch. We need to synchronize our watches. You know, the time was set back. Uh, any of you heard about that? Yeah, the, the time was set back. Or your phone, if you don't have a watch. And, and God's saying, we need to synchronize our watches. How about that? You know, th bad things happen if you don't synchronize your watch. Have you ever had that happen to you? Like my clock radio at home is the old style, and it doesn't, it doesn't uh, reset automatically, right? And so I look at that, I say, oh, it's, it's an hour sooner or later or whatever. So God is saying we need to synchronize our watches because if for everything there's a time and there's a season, and we need to synchronize our watch to his watch. And there's a, a passage in scripture where it talks about a group of people called the sons of Issachar and they understood the times and they knew what God's people should do. Now that's really something. Wouldn't that be good if they could say that about us? The people at MCC understood the times, they're synchronized to God's time and they knew what, what God's people should do. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, Lord, we want to be like that. We really want to be like that. Well, somehow I got scheduled to preach between two ominous days. Really, actually, I'll tell you the real backstory. I got scheduled to preach because my daughter Molly pestered David and said, you know, we got all these people going to be in town. <laughs> you don't believe that, right? But that's, that's really what happened. <laughs> so, so here we are. But then when I noticed it was November 6th, it was between two really ominous days. On the one hand, there was Halloween. And on the other hand, it was election day. Now, if you think about it, the two are pretty similar. <laughs> They're really pretty similar. And, and, and so my message is about ditch the disguises, but, but there's good news and there's bad news. <laughs> there we go. So the good news is Halloween's over. And because Halloween's over, you can ditch your mask. You, can, you don't need a mask anymore. But you know what the bad news is? Most people wear masks all year round. That's bad news. That's really sad, you know? And, and uh, I, I wanted to illustrate, and so I, I bought on, on Amazon... You know, all these, all these masks and different things I was going to illustrate. But you, you know what masks are. But, um, you know, there, there's a mask, you know. And, and we all have our, our different masks. And then, I, you know, I found out I didn't even need to buy any of those things. Because my precious granddaughter, Claire, Molly's daughter, gave this to me before church today. <laughs> So I didn't need to buy any of those things from Amazon. I already have a mask. I don't know if you would agree with me, but most of the time, we look better without the mask. What do you, what do you, what do you think? <laughs> Does anybody agree? Well, nobody seems to agree with me. Okay, I'll, I'll just wear this the whole time. Yeah, they call me Bobo. This, this pretty much looks like a Bobo mask, doesn't it? So anyway, Halloween's over. 
You can take your mask off. How about, isn't that good news? That's really good news. You don't have to wear a mask anymore. You don't, you don't have to try to impress anybody. You don't have to impress God because of what Jesus did on the cross. You're already accepted. He already loves you. He already thinks you're amazing and incredible. You don't need to do anything to impress him because he already has embraced you and says you are amazing. But here's, here, this is going to be an interactive message. You know, there's too many sermons, by the way, that are only one way, Right? I believe we should have interactive thing. That means it's okay if you say amen or something. You know, interact a little bit. But here's a, here's a Bible quiz question. What was the first Halloween in the Bible? You say, Halloween? There's no Halloween in the Bible. I beg to differ. There's the, the first Halloween in the Bible. The very first thing. The very first thing that Adam and Eve did after they said, what was that? They made coverings of fig leaves. Isn't that something? That's the very first thing that sin and shame will do. You have to cover it up. Isn't that something? And you know what? I never really noticed this before. It says that they had to sew together fig leaves. You know what that means? One is not enough. One lie is not enough. One cover-up is not enough. You need more. You need to sew together some lies. You need to sew together some cover-ups. And that gets to be kind of exhausting because you just never know if you're covered up enough. <laughs> wow. The fig leaves. The fig leaves. And, and, and here's another thing. This is not particularly relevant to the message, but not only did the fig leaves hinder their relationship with God, the fig leaves made it impossible for them to have intimacy with each other. Think about that. In order to reproduce, in order to have intimacy with each other, they had to take the fig leaves off. That's really, I don't know. I thought that was kind of profound. That's, that's really amazing. <laughs> you see, for us to have community, as David was talking about earlier, for us to have community, to have real relationships, we got to take the fig leaves off. Now, <laughs> that can seem scary, huh? That can really seem scary because fig leaves become a part of us. After a while, you're not even sure who you are anymore. You're not sure if you're the mask or the, the real person. It, it's hard. And, and so that messes up our identity and everything, but it messes up our relationships. It just messes things up. How about that? And, and speaking of the election, you know, the, the Israelites got to a place where they would just put on different masks according to where they were at. If they were in Baal territory, they'd put on a Baal mask. If they were in Yahweh territory, they'd put on a Yahweh. Whatever it was, they kept putting on masks. And guess what? That gets exhausting too. And so one day in 1 Kings chapter 18, the prophet Elijah gets up on Mount Carmel, gathers everybody together, and he says this. He says, how long... Are you going to hesitate between two opinions? How long are you going to waver between two opinions? If God is God, serve him. If Baal is God, well, serve him. But none of this stuff where you vacillate between the two, where you're, when I'm with Baal people, I'm going to be a Baal person. Oh, I'm with Christians, I'm going to be a Christian. That makes God mad. I'm sorry. That makes God mad. It makes him sad. He says, I want you to be a Christian all the time. I want you to glorify me all the time. But so often we have different masks according to who we're with. You know, we're with some Democrats, we'll have a Democrat mask. We'll have a Republicans, we're a Republican mask. We're just with whoever it is. We're gonna, we have a mask for every occasion. Ah, oh, God help us. God help us. You know, one of the most frequent words that Jesus used was the word hypocrite. What does that mean? Who knows what that word it came from the Greek? What's that mean? Huh? A play actor, right. I used to be a play actor between age five and age 12. I was in a lot of plays. Well, the interesting thing about, about the, the Greek world is they would have a, like if you would go to a musical down at Belt Theater, there might be 50 people, 
you know? And there's all these different characters. But in the Greek world, you would have like three characters and they would just keep using different masks. And so I think that was the same person that was <laughs> in the last thing. He was this. And, now, and, he, and, and so they would just put on different masks. Well, here's the interesting thing about it. Jesus didn't say, winos, prostitutes, tax collectors, hypocrites. What did he say? Come on, this is interactive. What did he say? Scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Why was that? Because it's a lot easier for us religious people to be hypocrites than it is for unbelievers. Isn't that weird? Because we're trying to live up to some image. And so he, he rebuked the religious people because religious folks have a tendency to, to wear a mask, to impress people, to even impress God. I remember when I first got saved, it was pretty easy for me to be transparent with people. You know, I'd come to some meeting and I'd say, well, I was only saved a couple of weeks ago. I'm still kind of dealing with lust and fear and anger and this and that. And, and they'd say, oh, that's okay. You're just new at this. That's all right. Well, then a month went by and two months, six months, a year. And then it was like harder to be honest, you know, like I've kind of been at this a while and I'm still dealing with certain things, you know. And now I've been a believer like 50 years and I'm still dealing with some things. It's harder and harder to be honest. And then you're in full-time ministry. Oh, man, you know, they, they assume that you really got it together, you see. Scribes, Pharisees hypocrites. Help us, God. And what this message is about, among other things, is that God didn't want us to be a social, uh, be a, a play actor anymore. He wants us to take the mask off. And we live in the age of social media where masks are abundant. And you know that? You know, everybody puts their highlight reel out. And then those of us that are pastors, we know what their real marriage is like and what their the real situation is with their kids. And, you know, they put on the, their anniversary, oh, my best friend and mom, they're so awesome. And you think, man, alive. Last week you told me you hated the guy. You know? um, <laughs> Help us, God, you know? Scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, and social media hypocrites. I mean, we're play actors. And if we're ever going to have revival in the church, it's going to come because we've taken our mask off. How about that? Wow. And, and I remember when I was a kid, I was obsessed by this creature here. Do you know what that is? Who knows what that is? This is interactive, remember? This is... It's a good job. It's a chameleon. And what's the characteristic of a chameleon? They take the color of whatever they're on. God help us. The reason why, I mean, I'm just being honest. Hey, come on. If I never preach again, that's all right, you know. <laughs> the reason there's no impact by the church in America is because we're chameleons. And so... How are you going to change the world, change a culture, change a nation if you just fade into whatever background you're in? Help us, God. Forgive us, God. Are you a chameleon? You know, chameleons are kind of cute. They're kind of, kind of cool. But they're not godly. And if we had more time, if I had another few messages to give, I'd, I'd talk about some chameleons in the Bible. Lot. How about Lot? You know, when he was with Abraham, he was a pretty godly, oh, well, yeah, the God of Abraham. Oh, you know, we, he, he could talk a good talk. And then he goes to Sodom and guess what? He fit in there just fine. If you fit in fine with Abraham and with Sodom, you just kind of are a chameleon. And then there's Samson. You know, one day he was fighting the Phil Philistines and the next day he's sleeping with one of them. God, help us. I'm sorry. It's time to quit being chameleon. D decide which side we're on. Are we with the Lord? Are we with Baal? What side are we on? <clears throat> but you know, sometimes it's really hard in the church because uh, like I grew up, one of the very first pastors I had, his name was Bill. And he had sort of like a mega church of sorts in Columbus, Ohio. 
He was an amazing preacher. A lot of people got saved, healed, marriages, God rescued, all kind of stuff happened. The guy was powerful. But he had this characteristic. If you would ask how he was doing, he always said the same thing. How are you doing, Pastor Bill? Fantastic. It took about 30 seconds. I'm, I'm, short, I'm shortening it just for the sake of time here. Yeah. But he was doing fantastic, you know. And, and I remember one Sunday, I ran into him in the hallway. Hey, Pastor Bill, how you doing? Gave the standard answer. Fantastic. And just like two days later, I read in the Columbus Dispatch, the main newspaper, he and his wife are getting divorced. And not too much longer after that, I found out he's marrying another guy's wife. But he was fantastic. And here's, here's something, I'm going to ask a really tough question, and then I'm not going to resolve it. I'm just going to leave it to you. Pastor Bill was kind of part of the Word of Faith movement. I'm kind of part of the Word of Faith. I like the Word of Faith. You know, you, you find scriptures, and you claim them, and you confess them, a positive confession. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. I love that stuff. But I'm torn. I'm really torn. Because on the one hand, I believe in the power of our words, and I believe in the power of confession. I believe in all that stuff. But on the other hand, I believe in honesty and, and, and being vulnerable, being transparent. And I don't know how to go on that. See, if Pastor Bill could have had somebody to share what was going on in his life and his marriage that things really weren't so fantastic, he might have got healed. He might have got helped. Some of the, the destruction might have been prevented. But no, he had to be fantastic. Hey, I'll tell you, it's exhausting to have to be fantastic all the time. Have you discovered that? Have you discovered that? You don't have to be fantastic all the time. You don't have to have your mask on anymore. You can be honest. You can be real. Because the reality is God loves you like you really are. Not how you pretend to be, how you really are. And the amazing thing we found in our community groups and in Prime and different things, guess what? People would rather have you be honest about who you really are and you might think they're going to reject you, think you're terrible, they're going to kick you out. No, they're going to love you. See, if, if, if I have a mask on and somebody says, well, I love you. I think you're amazing. Well, I don't really know if they really love me or if they just love the mask. But the cool thing about God is he knows, he knows what you're really like and he still loves you. And the amazing thing about the body of Christ, the real body of Christ, is that when people find out what you're really like, guess what? Shock of all shocks. They will still love you. Wow. Isn't that incredible? Whew. Well, uh, we're going to transition a little bit to, to 2 Corinthians because Paul in 2 Corinthians, even though he's this great, amazing apostle, he shares who he really is. And, and first of all, he's talking about, he says, if a person comes and preaches another Jesus whom we did not preach, or you receive a different spirit which you did not receive, or a different gospel, you, you, know, you put up with it splendidly. Basically, we live in a day when we need some discernment because there's a lot of other gospels. And, and, you know, I said that the first uh, Halloween was Adam and Eve. There was actually one before that, a little bit before that. So if I could find it in my bag of tricks here. So it's a snake if you can't see it. Eh? So Paul says these false apostles were disguising themselves. Three times in just two verses, it says disguise. Disguising themselves as apostles of, of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no great surprise if his servants also disguise themselves. Have you ever wondered, how did some snake, some serpent, talk Adam and Eve out of the most amazing gig in the world, being in this fantastic garden with God as their father and their creator and their friend. How did he do it? Because he didn't look like a snake. 
He didn't look like a serpent. He looked like an angel of light. He was radiant. He was beautiful. And they said, whoa, this is really cool. Maybe we can be like that. Yeah, right. Didn't work out well. <laughs> so anyway, they disguise themselves. And, and look at this. This is, a, this is a, a cool thing. Whenever, <laughs> say that with me, whenever. Awesome. Whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil, the mask, is removed. We all with unveiled face are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. So how do we get transformed? Well, the first thing is you got to take off your mask. It's with unveiled face. God is not going to transform your mask. He's not going to transform your mask. If you still got your mask on, you're not going to really be transformed. Sorry. And so we keep trying to find a better mask, you know, trying to change our image, change our mask. He says, no, if you're going to be transformed, you got to take your mask off. You have to have unveiled faces. <sighs> Being in the presence of God. And you know what's so cool? The presence of God is always a safe place. You don't need a mask. You don't need a veil. You can, you, David, all the way through the Psalms, think about that. God, I think you're terrible. <laughs> I hate these circumstances. Many of those that rise up against me. Whoa. <laughs> he was honest. David was a man of unveiled face before the Lord. And because of that, he was a man after God's own heart. How about that? Unveiled faces. Remove the veil. Isn't that something? Romans 12, 2 talks about being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And he says, you're not going to be transformed if you're conformed on the outward. You have to be transformed by what's in your heart. The renewing of your mind. Isn't that something? And here's something I never thought of before. What happened when Jesus died in the temple? Remember the temple? There's this great big curtain that for hundreds of years separated the people from the presence of God, except once a year. It was four inches thick, 60 feet tall, and it was big. It was imposing. And what happened on the day Jesus died? It was torn. It wasn't torn by some priest down the bottom. It was torn by God from top to bottom. Think about this. On the day Jesus died, boy, this gives me goosebumps. Whew. God removed his veil. <laughs> Isn't that something? He says, I can't take it anymore. I can't stand it anymore. I don't want to be separated from my people anymore, except as once a year, the high priest can come in. God removed his veil and he said, I can't take it anymore. And he tore the thing apart. And he says, you can come into my presence boldly to the throne of grace. Here we go. You know, come boldly. You don't have to be timid. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to just come once a year. He tore the veil into, man, shoo, help us, Lord. Well, <laughs> A few, few more things. So, so what does it look like when somebody removes the veil in, in their own life, you know? What, what's it look like? Well, here's Paul, and Paul really, the whole book of 2 Corinthians, he does this. He says, we don't want you to be unaware. In other words, we want you to know what's going on with us. Have you ever got a support letter from some missionary or some preacher or something? A lot of times it's like, oh, God is moving, great things are happening. Well, here's Paul, the greatest missionary of all time. He says, well, uh, I want to tell you what's really happening here. <laughs> Isn't that something? He says, I don't want you to be unaware of our affliction that took place in Asia. We were completely overwhelmed beyond our strength. Isn't that something? Have you ever felt overwhelmed? Have you ever got to a place that was beyond your strength? That's like part of God's great purpose. You know, when they ate the forbidden, forbidden fruit in Genesis chapter 3, it was basically them trying to say, hey, we can run our own life. We're strong enough, smart enough. You know, we just eat this fruit, we can do it. 
And here God is, he's trying, he's purposely trying to overwhelm us, give it a situation. You, you ever heard the thing, God never gives you more than you can handle? <laughs> that. <laughs> no, the fact of the matter is, God never gives you more than you can handle with his help. But he frequently frequently gives you more than you can handle without his help. How about that? So Paul said, we were overwhelmed. It was beyond our strength. We despaired even of life itself. I don't even know what that means. It sounds like he just wanted to die. So that we would, this is such a powerful line, that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Are you still just trusting in yourself and your own strength, your own ingenuity? God says, I want to get you to get to the place where you're not trusting in yourself. You're trusting in me. Wow. 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 And, and, it's, and it's interesting, um, speaking of the community groups and prime and things like that, Paul said that because we've opened our heart to you, you can open your heart to us. If you wonder why people don't really open up to you very much, it might be because you haven't really opened up to them. And Paul says, hey, we've opened up to you. We've told you what's really going on. Open your heart to us. And then this is, one, this is an amazing verse here, 2 Corinthians 4, 7. This explains a lot. You know, there's a lot of mysteries, confusing things. He said, we have this treasure in clay jars so that this extraordinary power may be from God and not from us. Now look at this. Some people are all about the clay jar. Oh, we're only human. <laughs> well, if you're only, only human, I guess you're just a clay jar. But other people like Pastor Bill, it's like the treasure, the glory, the Holy Spirit. And that's not exactly, that's kind of unbalanced too because the fact of the matter is we have the glory we have the treasure. We have extraordinary power, but it's in a clay jar. That, that's, that's a pretty amazing thing. Help us, Lord. So when we look at other people, do we see just the clay jar or do we see the treasure? We have to see both of them are true. And then it gets down to what we're going to kind of end things with pretty soon here. He says, from now on then, we don't know anyone from a worldly perspective, and other versions say, according to the flesh, or we don't know anybody by what we see in the outside. That's a really interesting thing, and it goes on to say that if any person's in Christ, they're a new creation. Well, why is that important? Because so often we see people according to how they look, how they seem. We see them with all their faults and flaws and, and all that kind of stuff. But Paul says, you know what? We're not looking like that anymore. We're, we're looking at who they are in Christ. We, we see people with the eyes of Jesus. Isn't that something? Do you, do you see people with the eyes of Jesus? Or do you just see them like they are? Just see them like they behave. You're good at pointing out their faults and their flaws and all that kind of stuff. No, Paul said, we don't look at the flesh anymore. We don't look at their outward appearance. We don't look at their behavior patterns. We see another side. And in other places, he says, you know, I, I'm confident that the one who began a good work is going to finish it. You know, he saw a whole different thing. God's going to do a great work, not because of you, but because of who he is. And this is one of the most astounding verses in the Bible. I mean, it's my, one of my favorite verses, 2 Corinthians 7, 16. Here's what he says. <clears throat> I rejoice that I have complete confidence in you. New American Standard says, I rejoice that I have confidence in you in everything. Wait a minute. I don't know how many of you read 1 Corinthians, but in 1 Corinthians, he's dealing with divisions, and there's some say, I'm going to follow Paul, I'm going to follow Apollos. They're all divided. They're taking each other to court. How about that? You know, a lot of, they needed a lot of lawyers in the church, Robert. You know, I mean, that, that's really something, you know. We need, need more lawyers. We, we got to sue some of these brothers and sisters here, you know. Oh, and they're having immorality, you know. This, this one guy's having sex with his, his dad's wife. And, 
wow, they got to deal with that. And then they're arguing about the spiritual gifts and they go to communion and get drunk. And, and, and then they, they're not even sure about the resurrection and meat offered idols. The place is a mess, you see. And yet Paul says, you know, I have complete confidence in you. How could that be? Because his confidence wasn't really in them. His confidence was in the Lord. His confidence was in in the one who would finish the work that he started. His confidence was in the power of God to continue to transform these people. What? Help us, Lord. I love that. I rejoice that I have complete confidence in you. Wow. Uh, look to somebody next to you. Some of you, you're too quiet here. Got to get interactive. Say to somebody next to you, I have complete confidence in you. <laughs> okay. So, 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 so now you, oh, that's enough. Okay. So, so now you can repent of, for lying. Oh, but, <laughs> but anyway, we need to be confident in the Lord concerning the people. How about that? Well, anyway, uh, let let me ask this. I'm going to share a a story as we end about the very first time I encountered the grace of God. I was just five years old. I didn't even know it was the grace of God. Have you ever encountered the grace of God? I mean, really encountered the grace of God? What I realized, I'm taking a little sidetrack, but this is really important. I love the prodigal son story, but I finally figured out what it was all about just a couple days ago. The older brother, if you remember the story, he was there hardworking, staying at home, everything. The young guy, the prodigal, he was out there carousing around, spending all his dad's money and, you know, uh, feeding the pigs, right? Well, the guy feeding the pigs, the prodigal, he comes home and his, his dad puts a new robe on him and f- ring on his finger and, and kills the fatted calf and has a big party and everything's fantastic. The older brother is mad. And I thought to myself, what was going on there? The, here's the deal. The older brother never experienced the grace of God. Why? Because he didn't think he needed it. Think about it. Just let that sink in a little bit. He didn't think he needed it. He was hardworking. He said, I never went astray. I never fed the pigs or went with prostitutes or any of that stuff. He didn't ever need it. And here's the thing. You'll only really experience the grace of God if you realize you need it. Now, here's here's the good news. We all need it. You're not alone. You might need it in a different way than I need it, but we all need the grace of God. But the older brother didn't think he needed it. Oh, I'm a lot like the older brother. I am an older brother. I'm, I get it. But when I was five years old, something happened to me. My teacher in kindergarten had a stack of coloring books and put it on her desk and said, hey class, these coloring books were donated. And after lunch, I'm going to give a coloring book to each one of you. And I thought, I was kind of an entrepreneurial, smart kind of guy, you know, even at age five. And I thought, now, if I go during lunch and I take one of the coloring books off of her desk and put it in my desk, and then she passes out after lunch, coloring books to everybody, I'll have two. I think I was into the double portion stuff, you know, I was in, I think I was into the faith message even before I realized it, you know. So I get a coloring book when no one's looking, put it in my desk. The only problem is when she came to to hand out the coloring books, she saw I already had one. Now to me, it was like, that's a minor offense. I mean, it's not a big thing. Miss Brooks hit the roof. I have a thief in my class. And she said, Jimmy, go down and see Dr. Heil in the principal's office. I was five years old. Have you ever been to the principal? No, you don't have to raise your hand. I, I, could. I mean, I was five years old. I, what do they do to you in the principal's office? I mean, that was back in the day. <laughs> you know, they, they gave spankings, whacking, and, you know, who knows what they're going to do. I did I, hang you up by your thumbs. I don't know what they're going to do to me, you know? So I go down to Dr. Hiles' office, and guess what? He's on the phone. 
And I had to just sit and wait and stew and wonder, what is Dr. Heil gonna do to me? <laughs> you know, it was scary. And so finally, Dr. Heil comes out, he's off the phone and he comes and he's only like 5'10", but he looks down, you know, I'm just this little five-year-old. And he says, well, what are you here for, Jimmy? I said, I stole a coloring book off my teacher's desk. I kind of wait for, what's he gonna do now? And he looks down and he said, Jimmy, you're a fine boy. Go back to your teacher. That's all he said to me. Jimmy, you're a fine boy. And I thought, wow, I'm a fine boy. That's amazing. And I wasn't going to wait around a lot. He might change his mind. You know, he might, you know, and, and so I go back to my teacher. And what does the teacher say? What did Dr. Heil say to you? He said I was a fine boy. So, so, so then she thought I was a liar. He could, no, no way Dr. Heil could say he's a fine boy. No way. And then my mom found out later. And she said, I mean, I don't know whether to laugh or cry on this. She said, I would rather have a sword thrust into my side than have my son be a thief. <laughs> <laughs> that was not one of her better days, you know. <laughs> but you see, I experienced the grace of God. Not because I deserved it, because grace means you didn't deserve it. If you think you can deserve it, if you can earn it, if you can merit it, if you can be good enough, you're never going to really receive it. You're never going to really get it. Jimmy, you're a fine boy. Can you hear the Lord saying something like that to, you know, to you today? Tessa, you're a fine girl. Kim, you're a fine girl. You know, Bill, you're a fine boy. You know? can, can, can you hear the Lord saying that to you? Because that's what he's saying. He said that to his son, Jesus. You're my beloved son. But Jesus didn't need any forgiveness, but we do. <clears throat> Well, anyway, I'm going to have a, an altar call, but this is a different kind of altar, altar call. Um, most altar calls, we try to find some poor sinner or somebody that's struggling or not doing well, and we say, you come up if you're struggling, if you're some poor sinner and you need salvation or you need something, right? <clears throat> this is a different kind of altar call. This is an altar call where we all, I'm going to invite you all to come up. If you have to go get your kids or some great emergency is going, okay, fine. But otherwise, I want all of us to come up because why? Because we're all in the same boat. We're all in need of the forgiveness and grace of God. All of us are. And there's basically three things as you come up that I want you to do just silently in your heart. One is to confess. I had to confess to Dr. Heil. I had to tell him what I'd done. Now, you might not have stolen anything except maybe tithes and offering. How about that? In Malachi chapter three, that's another matter. That's a whole nother message. <laughs> It'd be better to steal a coloring book than to, yeah. it's another, another matter. But you, you might have to confess something. There might be some secret sin in your life that no one knows about that you need to confess. You know what I confess, I thought about this this week. Gosh, this is, this is a real rabbit trail. <clears throat> I've shared the gospel with a fair amount of people in 2022. I have not led one person to the Lord that I know about. Now, that might not seem anything radical to you. But that's terrible. That's, that's, that's like backslidden territory. I mean, that, we, we're made to reproduce. We're made to be witnesses. We're made to tell people about Jesus and see lives changed. And, and, and I realized, oh God, I'm, help me God. I want to see more. I want to see more happen. Anyway, I don't know. Maybe that's not what you need to confess, but what is it you need to confess? And then the second thing is, maybe you've never really encountered the grace of God. 
because you thought you could earn it. You thought you were good enough. You did enough good deeds and good works and read your Bible and came and volunteered to the church and all that stuff. That's fine. But, but he wants you to experience his unmerited favor today in a special way. He, he wants you to hear his voice in a special way today. You're my beloved son, my beloved daughter. And thirdly, I know all of us apply to this. I bet there's somebody in your life that you have a hard time believing God is going to change them. Ah. <laughs> Don't raise your hand to that one. You know. Yes. Yeah, some of you might be have a hard time thinking God's going to change your husband or your wife or your friend, your your kids, your sisters or brothers or whatever. You know, the fact is that's a sin because God can change them. He can transform them, he can do it. And if we see them according to the flesh and say, well, you know, they're never gonna change, we need to repent. Hey, thank you for watching the Sermon of the Week. We pray that you were blessed by it and you felt prompted to act upon what the Spirit of God was saying to you. If you live in the Charlotte area, we would love for you to come and worship with us at one of our weekend gatherings. That way you can find out more about our church family and what we value most. We encourage you also to give to our ministry so that we might continue spreading the gospel of Jesus to our city and throughout the world. To do so, you simply go to missioncommunity.cc, click on the give button, and the rest is simple. Lastly, I would encourage you to check out the remaining content on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to subscribe. That way you will receive all of the reminders for fresh content that we put out. Have a wonderful rest of your day. May God bless you and thank you again for watching this week's message.